Good evening, everyone. Uh, CHBC, uh, who are tuning in, and obviously, as again, a special uh, welcome to those who are tuning in from abroad. Uh, hope tonight proves to be a blessing uh, for you during these times uh, and as we hear God's word. And also just a, a thanks to the guys and the team at the back who are making these uh, streams possible while everyone is at home. Uh, thanks, gentlemen, and thanks uh, everyone else who comes in each week. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening we're, get, we're continuing our series in 1 Corinthians uh, and we really reach the end of a portion here uh, that Paul has been working uh, through from chapter 8. Uh, so uh, this evening's passage is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, verses 23 following. Can I encourage you at, uh, sending the, at the risk of uh, a broken record if you have a Bible on you or grab your phone, but please bring the text up so you can see we're going to be referring to it extensively tonight and there will be blessings uh, to be received uh, by looking closely at the text. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 uh, to chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 to 11, verse 1. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience's sake. But the other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, approach you now and... Uh, Lord, our hearts are still uh, troubled, uh, filled with sorrow at the fact that we can't gather together. You know this, Lord, and we seek you for wisdom as we plan to move forward. Uh, but at the present, we find ourselves apart. And Lord, we ask that you would meet us where we are. And we pray you would speak to us through your word. We pray for the precious ministry of the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word so that it might bring understanding to us. And God, not just understanding, but application to our lives, so that we may not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. We want to change. We want to live these things. We don't want to be hypocrites. I pray that we would hear clearly from you this evening. I pray you would challenge us, and I pray that Christ again, as always, will be lifted up. He is the Lord of the church, and all things are heading to him. And so we pray that he would be magnified in this time. Give us ready hearts to receive. And Lord, help us to fight against distraction and the worries of this life. And we pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. When you look at the picture of your life, the choices that you make and the outcomes that have brought you to where you are today, and you have to ask the question, how did I get here? Or why do I do what I do? Or why do I make the choices that I make? The question is, what governs the decisions that you make every day in your life? What is the governing principle? Now, that can be a searching question as we look at the myriad of things we do each day. Paul isn't happy with the way the Corinthians are living. And the way that he addresses this 
is by looking at their governing principle. What, what causes them to do what they do? How do they decide on the choices that they make? And he's going to correct it, and he's going to correct it sharply. Now, the context, as I, as I said, is uh, we're still in. He's addressing the issue of eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. And he's been talking about this since chapter 8, and now he reaches the end of the discussion here. First point uh, I want us to see uh, this evening. The first point, Paul addresses a sinful view of Christian freedom, a sinful view of Christian freedom. Look at just the first few words of verse 23. Everything is permissible. And you'll see they're in quotations there. Everything is permissible. Literally, everything is lawful or everything is allowed. Everything is acceptable. And he repeats it twice in that verse, which is in quotations. Now, if you've been reading 1 Corinthians and following on, along, you'd remember that he has already quoted this saying in chapter 6. And he quoted it twice there as well. And the context was uh, sexual freedom and how we can carry ourselves uh, and justify sexual behavior. This quotation, everything is permissible was the was the corinthian slogan it was their governing principle it's how they decided the things that they were allowed to do everything is permissible means we're free in christ we're not under the law and we can do as we please this is how they decided the way they should live now for our generation we don't really use this phrase everything is permissible what do we use today? What's, what's the modern uh, Christian slogan, as it were? Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, lest you be judged. And when you look at it, that phrase, that verse, is used to justify sinful behavior, just like the Corinthians used their phrase. It was a number of years back, and I met this Christian guy, and it was through a mutual friend, and we became friends. And he'd been a Christian, a professing Christian, for a number of years. And I had him on social media, and he just started uh, going to the gym. He'd been going for a while, a number of months. And on his Facebook page, he would continually post photos of himself close up with his shirt off. And this was problematic already because he was a professing Christian. But what stirred me and caused me to write to him was at the bottom of every photo of himself with his shirt off, he would have a Bible verse underneath. Praise be to God uh, how, uh, and quote other kind of verses at the bottom of these pictures of himself. So I wrote to him and I, and I, and I basically said, just said to him, don't use the scriptures to flaunt your vanity and to showcase your body for compliments. He wrote back to me, what was the response that I got? Quote, judge not lest you be judged. Read that verse sometime, Nathan. Matthew 7, 1. This is used by Christians to justify sinful behavior, swearing, drunkenness, relationships we enter. For the Corinthians, it is this saying they live by, everything is permissible. And now in this letter, Paul's already quoted their slogan four times, and it's obvious he hates it. He hates this saying. He hates it. Let me quote Clement of Alexandria. He was a second century Christian and he says this, quote, Those who take advantage of everything that is lawful rapidly deteriorate into doing what is not lawful. End quote. And this is so true. The Corinthians abused their freedoms and before you knew it, they were visiting prostitutes and now they're going to pagan temples and participating in their food feasts. And so this is the context. What, when we get verse 23 here, Paul quoting this saying, it comes on the heel of what uh, Pastor Will preached last week of them attending these pagan feasts in pagan temples. And, and Paul, he anticipates their theological defense. He's addressing it and he's like, they're going to get worked up. They're going to fight me on this one. So he quotes their saying twice and then he cuts down their saying twice. He attacks it and brings it to nothing. Look at verse 23. Everything is permissible, 
but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. You, you may have many freedoms in Christ, but the use of them may not be helpful. They may not be profitable. They can be misused. Christian, are you free to drink alcohol? Yes, you are. But is it beneficial to drink alcohol in front of your children? Or is it beneficial to drink alcohol socially with unbelievers? Probably not. Probably not. The negative possibilities might outweigh the positive. Christian, are you free to buy incredibly expensive cars? Yes. Is it beneficial to unbelievers to see you driving those things? Does it point them to the fleetingness of this life and that it's all going to turn to rust and we're going to stand before God one day? Does it do that? Probably not. Paul also says, not everything is constructive. Literally, the, the, the imagery of that word is, is referring to building a house or building a tower from the ground up. Not everything builds up. Christian, are you free to buy the latest things and the most top-of-the-range things? Are you free to do that? Yes, you are. But will having all of those things be beneficial to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or will it potentially lead them to envy and stir up jealousy in them to have what you have? Paul is saying, do not live by the principle is it lawful for me to do it? Is it allowed? Don't make that your principle. Rather, he says, ask the question, is it beneficial? Is it profitable? Is it constructive? That's how we should live. So how do we choose? How do we make the choices, the myriad of things that come our way each day? How do we choose what we do and what we don't do? Or better yet, let me ask like this. How do we know if something is simply just permissible or if something is both permissible and beneficial? If something is both permissible and constructive, how do we work that out? Well, Paul gives a Christian's life principle. Look what he says in verse 24. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Now, unfortunately, the NIV here really softens, softens the, the translation here. It kind of makes it sound like Paul is giving some helpful advice. But, but in the Greek, this is a direct command. Let no one seek their own good, but the good of others. The principle is the good of others. See, we're often prone to, I want to do this because it makes me feel good. I want to do this because I enjoy it, or it makes me happy, or this is what I like. That's why I do things. Let no one, Paul says, no one seek their own good but the good of others. And this mindset is so unnatural to us. It is so unnatural. We are the me, myself, and I generation. iPad, iPhone, selfies, Blogs about ourselves, Facebook, Instagram, us, 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 me, 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 me. We live and breathe and move in a me culture. And self-fulfillment and self-expression have become our golden calf. Self is at the forefront. Now, the reality is humanity has always been inward focus, self-centered. We always have been that way. But now... We have the technology and the abilities to express it in all of its ugliness and even just at the click of a finger. See, we, when we read history, we scoff at people in the past, ancients who've gone before us, who used to build statues of themselves. We take photos of ourselves and post them online to the world. We write blogs about ourselves and our lives and showcase them to the world. It's the same disease. And Paul says, your decisions have been based all about yourself, based on yourself. Seek the good of others. Seek the good of others. Jesus said, love your neighbor. 
Love your neighbor. This is the principle. Paul just touches on it here. He's going to flesh it out at the end of the passage. This principle that should be governing our lives. So we've seen him address their sinful view of Christian freedom. Now he's going to deal with everyday scenarios of Christian freedom. So our second point is Paul dealing with everyday scenarios of Christian freedom. Now, when it came to Christianity, Paul didn't have theology kept in a jar in the kitchen while application and living was stored in the basement. No, theology and application and practice, they always went hand in hand. They were bride and groom. They were inseparable. They lived together. And Paul always does this in his writings. Let me quote Alexander McLaren and what he says regarding the New Testament. Quote, The greatest truths were used to regulate the smallest duties. End quote. Theology determines the decisions of how we live. And so Paul gives now three common scenarios that the Corinthians would face in their everyday lives. Now remember, the context is food, sacrifice to idols, and whether or not they could eat that as Christians. Chapter 8, they were causing each other to stumble by their practice. In chapter 10, they were going to pagan temples to eat and join in the feast. So here in these scenarios, Paul's going to show them where their Christian freedom begins and where it ends. Scenario number one that he gives. He gives them three. Scenario number one. Look at verse 25. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. Now the scene here is the Corinthians going to the local butcher in the city. Now the issue was some of the meat at the butcher there, it came directly from local farming and was, brought, and was there sold. But some of the meat came directly from the temple, having been part of a ritual and a ceremony, and then made its way to the butcher for sale. And the Christian might not be able to determine whether or not it came straight from the local farm or whether it came from a temple. Now, what were they to do? What were Christians supposed to do at the butcher? Paul says to them, buy anything from the meat market. Buy anything. Paul says, go ahead and eat it and don't ask any questions regarding conscience. Why does he say this is okay? Well, he quotes Psalm 24, verse 1. Look at verse 26 here. He's reasoning, For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. God has given animals to mankind. And they have been given because they belong to him. You can't give what you don't have. Psalm 50, verse 10, the Lord says, The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. So when you watch National uh, Geographic and you're watching a documentary and you see those vistas teeming with wildlife, God is saying, it's all mine. And I've given it to you. I've given it to you. And I've given it generously so it's to be received with thankfulness. Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That was used by Jews of old as a prayer over their meals. What a wonderful prayer when we give thanks for our food. Lord, all of this, everything in the earth comes from you and belongs to you. What a wonderful prayer. And Paul quotes that here. And he says, don't raise questions of conscience. He's saying, don't get your conscience unnecessarily tangled up. Don't, don't get it involved in this. It's not a matter of conscience. Don't hassle the shop owner with questions regarding where the meat came from. Jesus did not save us to become meat detectives. He does not put this burden upon us every time we want to eat a meal. We have to go through this rigorous procedure just to know if we can eat it or not. Jesus didn't save us for that. And so Paul says here, buy the meat, take it home, eat it with your family, give thanks for it to your Father in heaven who supplied your daily bread. Give him thanks, enjoy it, enjoy the meal with your family, have a laugh, give thanks. And so the lesson here is, if the meat sacrificed to idols is not in the temple, if it's not part of a ceremony, if it's not in the act of worship, then it's fine to eat. You're good to eat it. If it's not part of a feast, if it's not during worship, you're fine. If it's left the temple, has been loaded onto the truck and has arrived at the butcher, you're good to go have the barbecue. That's what he's saying here. You're fine. So that's the first scenario that he wants to clear up. Look at the second one. 
Christians uh, could ensure that they didn't go to pagan temples and, and participate. Christians could ensure that they didn't go to religious feasts and, and therefore avoid it. But what was a Christian to do if an unbeliever, a friend or relative, invited them over for dinner? And the Christian wouldn't know whether or not the meat on the table was food that had been sacrificed to idols, was meat that had been sacrificed to idols. What were they to do? Look at verse 27. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. Same principle as before. He says, eat whatever is before you, even if you don't know what the origins are of the meat, where it came from. Just eat it. Go ahead. And he says the same thing. Eat it without raising questions of conscience. Don't get your conscience involved again. It's unnecessary. It doesn't need to be. Plus, you are the guest in someone's home. If you start uh, sending a barrage of questions to the host about the meat and its origins and what happened to it and all that, you will offend your host. Don't do that. Rather, please your host by leaving nothing left on your plate. Show him how thankful you are. And, and, and this, is the, this is the advice Paul gives, because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Now, this shows us the wonderful freedoms that we have in Christ, especially in regards to eating. The Jews of old in the Old Testament, they did not have these freedoms to eat anything. They did not. But we have these freedoms. Okay, so the first two scenarios, very easy, very straightforward. The Christians get to keep their freedom. Look at scenario number three. It's exactly the same as scenario number two, yet with a twist. Something happens just before the Christian takes their first bite at the dinner table. Look at verse 28. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. So Paul says the scenario now, you're at the dinner but if the host comes out and just before you start to eat, the host walks out with a meal and says, this has been sacrificed and was part of an offering to the great Artemis. Paul says, put the fork down immediately. Don't eat. Don't take a bite. The meal stops there. You do not engage. It's now completely off limits. Now, when you look at that and you read that, it seems so inconsistent. I mean, I mean, Paul, what, what are you doing here? You've just said we can go to the meat markets and we can blissfully and ignorantly buy any meat that we want. You've also just said that we can go to an unbeliever's house and he can put any meat before us. And if the host doesn't say anything, just starts serving it, we can blissfully and ignorantly eat any of it. Why? Because you said, Paul, that the earth and everything in it belongs to the Lord. So we're free. And now you're saying, if the host just manages to mention that, by the way, this food has been devoted to Artemis or some god, now we can't eat it. That's inconsistent. That, 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 that is a foul. That does not fly. Well, what, what's going on here? Why the change in rule? Why the change in the law, as it were, for Christians here? Well, Paul explains why. Look at verses 28 to 29. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake, the other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. What's the reason? The other person, not you. The other person, the unbeliever. Don't eat it for their sake and also especially for their conscience's sake. What does Paul mean by this? What, 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 what's, he, what's he getting at here? Paul says, if the unbeliever announces this has been sacrificed to a God just before you eat, if he comes out into the room and says that, and then you awkwardly smile and then participate in that meal, you have just condoned, even if passively, the act of idolatry. And you have just condoned your host's act of idolatry. It's sin. It's sin. You've done it. Let me give you an example. Here. Say, say a friend invites you over, invites you over to the house, and they're so excited to offer you a taste of this rare vintage wine that they've got their hands on. And they ask you, can I, can I pour you a glass? It, it's, this is, you'll never have something like this again. And so you accept. You say, sure. 
But let's just say, as he's pouring the glass to you, he manages to say, hey, by the way, I swiped this. I stole this from my rich boss's office back at work. Immediately, you must refuse to drink that wine. Immediately. Why? Because if you go ahead and drink that wine, you have passively condoned the sin of theft. And you have condoned the sin of your friend who has just stolen. See the difference here? Paul says, don't eat for him. Don't eat because of them. And for their conscience's sake, he says. What does he mean for the unbeliever's conscience? What's he saying here? Paul doesn't want unbelievers to have a clear conscience in their sinful acts. He doesn't want them to do that especially in regards to idolatry. Christians, we should be targeting and aiming at unbelievers' consciences to wake them up. We should be doing what we can to stir and prick their consciences, not do the opposite and nurse their consciences back to sleep. Paul says we should be awaking their consciences. So don't participate. It'll be a loud sermon to them. So go back to the analogy of your friend who's offered you the stolen wine. If you don't participate, if you refuse, it should make them feel very uncomfortable. It should make them feel embarrassed over their sin. It should prick their conscience because you are calling them out. You are calling them out on their sin. And this is what John the Baptist did with Herod. He preached at Herod's conscience. It is not lawful for you to marry that woman. He went after the conscience. And so Paul's point is, if if you're in this scenario and you silently go along with it and you eat, you destroy your witness. You destroy the truth that you claim to hold that there is only one true God and sinners need to repent of their idolatry and believe in him. But Paul says, if you refuse to eat and you make a statement like that, it will be powerful. It will be powerful and you will not be condoning idolatry. Why? Because you can be sure of this. Idolatry is a one-way ticket to hell. It is. God has taught us that. So Paul says, if they mention it's been offered to idols, don't eat it for their sake. The good of others. This is that principle fleshed out. Now verses 29 to 30, I'm not going to read it again, but verses 29 to 30 seem to be out of step with the passage and Paul's argument and it trips up. It trips us up when we read it and it confuses us. It confused me. Uh, people say it just doesn't fit that what Paul's doing here. If I can just briefly uh, just, just make one little comment on this without getting too far into it. What I think Paul's doing here is that he's just reinforcing something. Why I'm telling you not to, not to eat this thing. It's not because of your conscience. Again, it's because of their conscience for the unbeliever. You're not this this third scenario doesn't cancel out the first two scenarios. Your conscience is still fine. This third scenario, you can't be denounced. It's about them. It's about their conscience. You're free when you eat things, but now don't do it for them. I think that's what he's getting at here. So firstly, we've seen Paul address their sinful view of Christian freedom. Secondly, we've seen Paul uh, give everyday scenarios of Christian freedom. And just lastly, finally, uh, Paul gives them principles to govern the use of our Christian freedom. Principles to govern the use of our Christian freedom. How do we make the choices that we need to make? What what, what should govern that? Paul briefly corrected their, their error in verse 24, right? He gave that principle. But now he's going to elaborate and show them exactly what he means. So now he's just given them three scenarios. Now he's going to give them three principles to govern their living. Three principles to govern their living. Let's look at verse. Look, let's look at the first principle, verse thirty-one. So whatever you, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. This is principle one, the glory of God. You remember in Isaiah chapter 6, the angels cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. 
His glory. No one can take away God's glory. Before there was any universe or any creation, God was glorious in His being. Glorious. Understand this. Even if every angel in heaven and every creature on earth decided to stop worshipping God, He would still be glorious. No one can take that from him. It's in his being. But we do understand we can dishonor God by the way we live. We cannot glorify him by the way we live. Let me quote John MacArthur here. He says this, quote, God is dishonored when anyone sins, but he is especially dishonored when his own people sin." Because he has specially honored us by his forgiving grace, we specially dishonor him by our sin. End quote. He has done so much for us, God. He made us and he bought us with the spilt blood of his son. And so glorifying God with our lives and our choices must be our goal in this life. For example, A disobedient child dishonors their parent. When a child disobeys, when a child's breaking the rules, a self-willed child, an unruly child, an unthankful child, a distrusting child, they dishonor their parents. They dishonor their parents. And so to us with God, when we sin and make choices for self, we dishonor God. We dishonor God. And yet on the flip side of that, an obedient child, a joyfully submissive child, a child that is thankful and trusts their parents, that brings great honor to their parents. And so to us with God, when we're thankful, when we trust Him, when we obey Him, when we're faithful to Him, when we live by His Word, when we live in dependent prayer for everything in our lives, we glorify God. We glorify God. Paul says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, think about that. Even the most minute details of our lives, eating and drinking, the smallest decisions we make in life, even that is to be done to the glory of God. If that's the case, how much more every other choice in our lives that we need to make? How much more? To the glory of God. How we work, our work ethic, to the glory of God. How we use our time, to the glory of God. How we use our finances, to the glory of God. The way we carry ourselves in our marriage, to the glory of God. The way we parent, discipline, and train and teach our children, to the glory of God. The relationships that we enter, and the spouse that we choose, to the glory of God. To the church that we commit to and choose to serve in, to the glory of God. Everything, everything to the glory of God. How different is God's principle than the Corinthians' principle? The Corinthians say everything is permissible. God says, do everything to the glory of God. What a great chasm. What is the chief end of man? The shorter catechism tells us the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Christians in past generations would catechize their children with that statement to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's why we were made. And so, Christian, when we pick up the TV remote, when we pull out our credit card, when we enter into a conversation that we must have, when we either take a a, a leap of faith or we stay put with a major decision, In everything, the governing principle is, will this glorify God? Will this glorify God? And so, Christian, every morning when we wake up, we must pray, God, there are so many things that are awaiting me today. Please, may your glory govern every decision that I need to make. May it influence every decision I have to make. That should be our prayer. So that's the principle number one, Paul says, The glory of God should influence our decisions. Principle number two, look at verses 32 to 33. 
Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Did you just hear what Paul said by the Holy Spirit? Did you hear what he just said? He said, I try to please everybody in every way. And I don't seek my own good, but I seek the good of everyone else. Isn't that a stunning admission? An absolutely stunning admission. What is the most common advice that we hear and we uphold today in the 21st century? Don't worry about other people. Do what makes you happy. Don't worry about everything else. Just do what you want. Do what pleases you. That's, that's, that's the advice that we live by. And then the man of God filled with the Holy Spirit gets up and he says, I seek to please everybody in every way. I don't seek my own good. I seek their good. What a difference. Why does Paul live this way? Is he just trying to be radical? Is he just trying to be countercultural and different? No, he tells us in verse 33, so that they may be saved. Why does he do it? So that they would be snatched from hell. So that they would be rescued. This was the ache and agony of his heart. Just read Romans chapter 9. Unceasing anguish for the lost. This is why he did it. So what did, when we get that principle, what did trying to please everyone in every way so that they would be saved, what did that look like? I mean, what does that actually look like, Paul? Well, look at verse 32 again. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. He says here, avoid causing anyone to stumble. Stumble literally means to hinder or stop them from coming to Christ. To hinder them and stop them from wanting to come and believe the gospel. In chapter 9, he's already covered this, how, how he relates to the Jews and Gentiles. He's happy to accept the traditions of the Jews when he's with them. And when he's with the Gentiles, he doesn't try and turn them into Jewish converts. He doesn't want to offend in any way. Paul tries to please in every way. And remember, he gives that great illustration of how he tries to seek the good of many and please everyone else. Pastor Paul worked a second job as a tent maker, just so that he wouldn't stop anyone from coming to hear the gospel or thinking it was associated with money and paying his wage. Paul didn't want others to stumble. Now, let me just get practical here. We must be absolutely careful that we do not bring offenses to unbelievers, that we don't do anything that would get them offside or get them offended. Can I just be specific? When we're relating to unbelievers, don't get involved with politics. Don't push your political agendas. I'm talking about pushing whether you're pro-vaccinated or anti-vaccinated. Don't push these things. Don't cause unnecessary offenses to people that might stop them from wanting to come to Jesus because they don't like your passion in these things. Don't do it. Paul wouldn't do it. Don't do it. See, understand this. We must do everything to not cause offense. Our gospel is offensive and we can't control that. But the way we carry ourselves and the things we talk about and the things we push, we can control that. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. How different, how different is God's principles to the Corinthians' principles. The Corinthians say, everything is permissible. And God says to us, do everything you can to please everyone, to not cause any to stumble, to seek their good that they might be saved. Paul is saying, seeking to win, win people to Christ, that's our motivation and it may, doing everything, it may mean doing everything we can to please them in a certain way. You see, this is so much more than at Christmas time, posting on Facebook, Jesus is the reason for the season. And then wondering why people don't comment underneath, wow, I just got saved and converted from your post. There's so much more than that. It's doing everything we can to reach them. 
It means inviting people over to our home so that we can show them the love of Christ. It means praying with people. It means visiting them. It means reading the Bible with them. It means giving up maybe our Saturday nights and our weekends to meet with them and love them and spend time with them. Whatever it takes to please them, to not cause them to stumble so that you can share the gospel with them. This is what he's saying here. First principle, the glory of God. Second principle, to please everyone in every way, to seek their good, not our own, to win them to Christ. And the third and final principle that he gives, chapter 11, verse 1. The chapter division here is so frustrating, it should not be there. Paul's finishing up in this next verse. Chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Paul has given them instructions. He's given them his own example and how he lives his life. But Paul's saying here, I'm no original. What do I do? I imitate someone greater than myself. I imitate someone who's gone before me. Remember principle one, do all things to the glory of God. Who did Paul learn that from? Doing everything to the glory of God. He learned it from Jesus This is what Christ did, how Christ lived. Do you remember in John chapter 17, verse 4, when Jesus is praying at the end of his life, and Jesus prays, Father, I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me. Jesus glorified God in everything he did. Do you remember principle two? I seek the good of everybody so that they might be saved. Paul says, I seek out people for the purpose of saving them. I seek their good. Does that sound familiar to anyone you know? Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is what he came to do. And Paul modeled his life of this. How did Jesus do that? How did he seek and save the lost? He ate at Zacchaeus' house. That crook. That traitor who gave Israel a Judas kiss. Jesus ate at Zacchaeus' house. Why? What was the purpose? To give Zacchaeus, to give that rich man something money couldn't buy eternal life. And Jesus knew it would cost him and his reputation. He did that. Jesus also ate at a Pharisee's house. We read that in Luke's gospel. He ate at a Pharisee's house. Why? Because Jesus didn't show partiality. And what was the outcome of Jesus doing that? The city harlot came, fell at his feet, cried all over him and poured perfume all over him. Found forgiveness and eternal life. Jesus sought the good of many so as to save them. He never sent the crowds away hungry. He healed them of their sicknesses and oppression. He even had time for the little children to bless them. He sought the good of many, and yet Christ did all of that, and yet in all of that, that actually could not save Adam's race. It could not. Yes, he served. Yes, he healed. Yes, he preached. Yes, he ministered. Yes, he prayed and interceded. Yes, he did all of these things. But that couldn't save us. All of that was to lead him. All of that was on the way up to a very, very dark hill of Calvary. So we heard this morning, Christ came to die. He came to die for sinners. He came to bear our sin, to die as our substitute, to stand in our stead, to take our place. He died for sinners so that all who would believe in him would be saved. This is what he did There are many verses in the scripture that talk about Christ dying for us, but one that is particularly applicable to what is going on here come from the lips of Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Self-sacrifice. I do this for others. I do this for others. And Paul says, I imitate Christ. That is a massive claim. That is a massive claim. And he did it, albeit as a sinner. He did it. He imitated Christ. 
Philippians 2 said, Christ humbled himself and became a servant. What do we look at in chapter 9 of Corinthians? Paul says, though I am free, I make myself a slave to all. He imitated Christ. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul says, Christ, who was rich, became poor for our sake so that we might become rich. What did Paul do? He was an esteemed Pharisee. He was a privileged, esteemed man. And he traded all of that, became poor for the sake of spreading the gospels, the gospel and making people rich in Christ Jesus. He imitated Christ. And what else does Philippians say? Christ humbled himself, became obedient even unto death. What do we see in the life of Paul? He willingly put himself in death's way so as to be able to preach the gospel in all different cities so as to save people. He imitated Christ. Paul did this. Paul did this. And so I close. Paul closes here. And Paul says, imitate me. Brothers and sisters, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. As I imitate Jesus. Paul is saying, the self-sacrificing Jesus, he's a pattern for Christian living, for every Christian. He is the pattern. The self-sacrificing Jesus is also the pattern for evangelism. It is. And so the challenge for all of us is to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. CHBC, your pastors and your elders are called to imitate Christ so that we can say to you, imitate Christ as we do. Please pray for us. Pray for Pastor Ian. Pray for myself. Pray for Pastor Will. Pray for your elders that we might live in this way. But CHBC, pray for yourselves. Because this isn't just written to pastors and elders. This is written to every Christian. This is how we are to live our lives. These are the governing principles that are to influence every single choice that we make. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Lord says. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, it is truth in the midst of crooked and perverse times. Lord, we want to humble ourselves and say sorry for so much of our lives, so many choices and decisions and actions that we have made that have purely been based on what is good for us and what pleases us. Please forgive us, Lord, that we have forgotten we have been bought with a price. I pray you may help us to look deeply into your word, to look and study the life of Christ, to look at your commands, to look at the commands you have for Christians, the way that you would have us to live. Help us to imitate Christ. Help us to glorify you with our lives in every area of our lives. Help us to please others in every way we possibly can without compromising so as to see them saved. Help us to reflect Christ on earth while he is still in heaven. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. May the Lord be with you and bless you this coming week.